Order. Order. Point of order, the Honourable Jerry Brownlee. Uh, Mr Speaker, I didn't like to interrupt the member uh, 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 again. As I... Order. This is a point that's, of and that's order. That's Ron. I order. said I didn't the, want order. to interrupt him again. Order. The, this is a point of order, I hope, and I want to hear it without interjections coming from my left-hand side. Jerry Brownlee. Well, Mr Speaker, for most of that speech, uh, the member giving it was reading uh, from a text uh, on his desk. This is the general debate. While we would accept that uh, written speeches would be appropriate for first and second readings and often third readings uh, by a minister who has to put a, a series of statements in the record for the courts, uh, in a general debate, uh, then, sir, I would hope that the standard would be that members speak freely, without notes, uh, and to the parliament. And so would I, and I bet before the end of this general debate the member who's just resumed his seat won't be the only member who unfortunately continues to read. It is a general debate. Members should be able to debate a general debate referring to notes without having to read speeches. I wish this would apply to all members. Uh, the Honourable Tim Grosser. Mr Speaker, Plan B for the New Zealand economy. Plan B. This wonderful mysterious Plan B. And I've been asking all of my friends and colleagues who owns the Plan B, what is Plan B, and how would it work? And it appears it's a little like hunting for a mysterious animal, like a unicorn. Everyone agrees it'd be a beautiful thing, but nobody's actually ever seen it. I mean, my office staff Googled Plan B and came out with a thousand pages, about 80% of which is Grant Robinson talking about the need for a Plan B, but nobody has yet identified what a Plan B would be. So we don't have a Plan B, Mr Speaker. No, no, we have a Plan A. We have a Plan A which has worked extremely well for New Zealand in the years that the New Zealand public gave us their confidence and we came into government. And I'm sure as we continue to execute and implement Plan A, it will continue to be a very sound basis. But trying to work out what Plan B was, well, I have to start from a speculative point of view that presumably Plan B is not Plan A. So what are the foundation stones of Plan A? Well, Plan A rests, in my view, on three central pillars. First of all, an orthodox and sound monetary policy which is centred on an independent central bank. Second, sound fiscal policy. And third, a highly complex series of actions known as the government's business growth agenda, which cover a multitude of issues from infrastructure through investment in ICT, through research and development and free trade areas. So I'm just trying to work out, well, if Plan B is the complement or the opposite of Plan A, what would that look like? I mean, what are the proponents of this mysterious and unknowable Plan B going to do about monetary policy? Would they not want what has just happened as a consequence of Plan A, which is, with a flexible exchange rate and the Governor given by this Parliament a mandate, the exchange rate has fallen around 25% on the basis of the cross rate, which has shielded our dairy farmers, and I'm pleased to see some modest relief this morning for them in the GDT overnight from Boston. Uh, would they want to reverse this? And what about the effects on our other exporters who are actually having a very good ride at the moment? So would that be part of Plan B, a different policy for the exchange rate? And the same could be said, Mr Speaker, about interest rates. As things have got a little more difficult internationally and zero interest rates still pertaining around the world, our own interest rates are at a very low point. Fortunately, they're still positive, which is a sign of strength. The countries in the greatest difficulty with their monetary policy are, in fact, countries with a zero or even perhaps essentially implied negative interest rates. So I don't think, I don't know what Plan B would be, but I think Plan A, and when it comes to monetary policy, is serving New Zealand extremely well. Then let's go to fiscal policy, Mr Speaker. Fiscal policy, what we see around the developed world is we have debt around the world which is averaging in the OECD close to triple figures, and in some cases over 200% of GDP. Our net crown debt to GDP is from memory around 32, 33%, and we're likely to be below 30 in a year or two. As the government led by Mr English, our Minister of Finance, has kept a heavy, steady hand, not 
cutting, slashing and burning as was claimed at the time. But continual discipline has managed to reduce our deficit caused, of course, by the conjunction of the global financial crisis and the Canterbury earthquake, where we did deliberately seek to borrow to shield vulnerable New Zealanders, the very people the opposition claims they speak for, from the full effects of this. And then we started a process of fiscal consolidation to the point where pretty much even Stevens at the moment. So I don't know what plan B would be like, but that's what plan A is. I don't think I'd want to see that reversed. And then we look at the elements of, well, people call it different things. Some people call it microeconomic reform. I think it's far broader than that, but that includes microeconomic reform. It's a con Kaizen, continuous improvement system of trying to ensure that this economy responds to competitive opportunities. And I'll start with FTAs. So FTAs, now let's just put one simple stat out there on the table. In the last seven years from 2008, New Zealand exports to non-FTA countries have declined on an average of 2.6% per year and have increased to FTA partners by slightly over 10% on average every year. I rest the case. Chris Hepp.